Heavy fighting in the Democratic Republic of Congo has forced hundreds of thousands of people to flee for their lives. The conflict between the government and M23 fighters has escalated in recent weeks. So what's driving all this and can peace be achieved? This is Inside Story. Welcome to the program. I'm Adrian Finnegan. A humanitarian crisis is developing in the Democratic Republic of Congo. An escalation in fighting between government forces and the M23 armed group in the northeast of the country is fueling regional tension. It's led to hundreds of thousands of people arriving in the regional capital, Goma, in search of food, water and shelter. The situation is expected to worsen when UN peacekeepers withdraw from the country at the end of the year, leaving many vulnerable at risk of starvation and violence. So what's driving this conflict and can a lasting peace be achieved in the Democratic Republic of Congo? Al Jazeera's Catherine Soy sent us this report from a camp for displaced people in Goma. We are at a camp for displaced people here in Goma. There are several camps um, scattered across the city. Uh, we have been talking uh, people who have been fleeing uh, this conflict uh, between government forces and M23. Uh, we have also been talking to um, aid workers uh, who are saying that they are overwhelmed about uh, the needs which are so many. 1.6 million people have so far uh, been dis uh, displaced um, since this conflict started about two and a half years ago. Now, the battle now uh, between the rebels and government forces is in a town called Sake. Uh, this town is very significant because it's the gateway into Goma. It's about 25 kilometers away from Goma and uh, government forces are trying to push the rebels away from that area and that is crucial uh, for them. There's been a lot of international pressure on all sides to de-escalate things and go back to mediation. It's going to be very interesting to see how that plays out because past efforts by regional leaders have failed. And what means what this means is that people in camps like this are going to continue suffering with no end in sight. Catherine Soy for Inside Story, Goma. Well, to get an idea of how the conflict is likely to unfold, let's turn to the Minister of Communication and Media spokesman for the government of the Democratic Republic of Congo, Patrick Moyaya, joins us from the capital, Kinshasa. Good to have you with us, sir, Patrick. What's your government's strategy for dealing with the M23? Is there a strategy? It's simple. For us, the M23 doesn't exist. M23 are the puppets of Rwandan government. The president made that point clear in our last meeting in front of President Kagame in Addis Abeba. The government, the Congolese government is working on, on, on the which way we can continue to implement the Luanda framework, which gives clear step of what you have to do. What we have witnessed in the past days, it wasn't M23 fighting, it was Rwandan army using his uh, surface soil missile, uh, shelling some displaced camp, shelling some markets. That's what, what we have seen last week. Uh, the president uh, made that point clear. We want to bring back peace in this part of the DRC quickly, but if we want to go back to go to the peace, we need to have Rwanda and start respecting the agreement we made, uh, especially in Rwanda. M23, M23 has no power to decide of what's going on, because for the M23, the plan was clear. They have to be disarmed, they have to be uh, to accept the cantonment, and they, they have to accept the mobilization. That's the only issue with them. We, won't nev we will okay. never negotiate with them. That point must be clear. But the M23 does exist. You've just said that they need to be disarmed. What is your government doing to start or to advance a political settlement here? And who would be involved in the we talks? Don't, your, 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 government, your government won't even enter into talks with the M23. 
as, well, as I was telling you before, M23 doesn't exist. It's Rwanda and government using puppet. And it's more simple for us to talk directly with Rwanda and talking to those puppets. It's clear the, 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 the government position would change on that side. That's why the president, I think, is traveling tomorrow to Rwanda to meet again with the president Lorenzo, who hosted the meeting in Addis Abeba between the president Chiseket and the president Kagame to see what it can do to start uh, effectively uh, implementing the land agreement. M23 is just a small part of the conversation. It is a proxy used by Rwanda uh, to be like the face of the bad war they are doing, of all, all those massacres they are committing against Congolese populations. Those are, those are very innocent people. So they, our position is clear. We're going to talk with Fanda to know why President Kagame is continuing to kill our population, is continuing to put his hand on our mineral resources, that the main reason of this war, and the president want this to stop this time and forever. So what is your government then doing for the displaced people in the northeast of the country, in the east of the country, the people caught up in this fighting? But what's your government yes, doing okay. to protect people? Yeah. Now, what, what, we are, what we are doing, especially for our people, is to use all the things we can do to bring back peace. Because if you want to solve the issue of displacing, displacing, displacing people, is to get them back in their respective area where they can continue what they've been doing before as activities. That the conversation we are having with some of our key partners, especially the United States, it's good to provide humanitarian help for all the are displaced. But the good thing here is to make United States and other Western countries to use uh, the sanction against the Rwandan government so they can stop this war. And then from there, the government will make sure to get back those populations where they've been living before. What we are doing now is to provide some help, is to provide some assistance, but this assistance won't be the, the real uh, solution for those people. They need to go back in their respective area. And we think that if we want to reach peace, once we stop with those bad actions from Rwanda and government inside our country, we will we'll be able to do that. All right, so many thanks indeed for being with us. That's uh, Patrick Muyaya there in Kinshasa. Thank you so much. So we've heard what the government in Kinshasa has to say about the conflict. Now let's hear some other perspectives. Lawrence Konyuka is the political spokesman of the rebel March 23 movement, also known as M23. He joins us now from the Eastern Democratic Republic of Congo. From Cape Town, South Africa, we're joined by Crystal Orderson, a journalist at the Africa Report and a veteran Africa commentator. And we're joined from Nairobi by Fred Baumer, who is the executive director of Ubuteli, an independent Congolese research institute focusing on politics, governance and violence. Let's start with you, Lawrence. What did you make of uh, what we heard from the government spokesperson? There are M23 just puppets of the Rwandan government. This is lack of knowledge of Patrick Muyaya and the competence of the DRC government. The M23 is a Congolese organization that signed a, an agreement with the DRC government on December 12, 2013, in Nairobi, uh, with guarantor, uh, the community of uh, diplomats, MONESCO, United Nations, SADEC, ACIGELA, and other international partners. We went to Kinshasa. We spent 14 months with the DRC government, with the team that President Gisekedi put in place for us to discuss the offer that M23 given of the voluntary and conditional surrender, the DRC government should come today say that we are a puppet of Rwanda. We are Congolese that have a cause. We've been asking the DRC government to discuss, to have a dialogue, to resolve the root causes of the conflict that making our country having a circles of war. We want to end it and to have a final lasting peace in our country. Let's bring in uh, Crystal Orson then uh, in Cape Town. What do you make of, of, of what you've heard so far, Crystal? 
Adrian, um, South Africa has about 3,000 troops that are heading to the DRC. They've sent a specialist unit, and already we've had body bags returning to South Africa. In fact, just this weekend, two soldiers that were killed in a mortar attack, their bodies arrived. So it's becoming a domestic issue. But, of course, the South African troops are part of a SADC mission to the DRC, which consists of South Africa, Malawi, and Tanzania. And I had spoken to South African diplomats and um, officials, both within the Army, um, and diplomatic um, officials, and they are adamant. South Africa is part of a peacekeeping mission. They want the DRC to have peace. They cannot afford conflict. The continent cannot afford conflict. Now, one could argue at times South Africa, um, it might be perceived as having a naive kind of viewpoint of um, peace building is necessary. It is um, time to bring different parties together. But South Africa has been involved in the DRC since the 1990s. In fact, former President Nelson Mandela in 1998, um, you know, heard the calls of Lauren Kabila Sr., the late Lauren Kabila, of course. Um, and he had, in fact, um, you know, dealt with Rwanda and Zimbabwe, who, you know, wanted to send a, um, a force there. Um, and so for South Africa, it is absolutely pertinent that there's peace in the DRC, peace in the um, east of Congo. Um, they, of course, um, as part of SADC, which is, a, you know, a more... Um one of the older regional bodies in Africa. Um, so this is a SADC mission, um, and they want ultimately for the DRC and Rwanda to come together and find a peaceful solution to what's happening in the East. Fred, Fred Baumer, um, what does the fighting itself look like now in the east of the country? Is there any coordination between the armed groups that are fighting in, in North Kiva? Who's, who's fighting who right now? I mean, how powerful is the M23 as a fighting force compared to, say, the Congolese army? I mean, who is fighting who is, is, a, is a good question. Um, because on one side, you have the Congolese government, of course, with uh, the support of, uh, of the SADC mission now, of uh, a huge range of uh, militias called uh, uh, Wazalendo, and also the, the, the UN keeping force and, and mercenaries. And on the other side, you clearly have um, M23 troops and, um, and according to many sources, uh, several, if not thousands, of uh, of Rwandan troops directly, directly on the ground. But I think um, just to emphasize what um, I've heard uh, and what Patrick was saying, also the uh, the, the the consequence, the, you, the biggest consequence of this violence is on is on people and uh, who have been displaced by millions since the beginning of uh, of this conflict. And people who want peace and people who want lasting peace and not only uh, short-term peace that will bring back, uh, bring us back to war as we've seen in 2012 and as we are seeing right now. Uh, and and it's clear what Congolese government and other group are facing in, in Eastern DRC around Goma is more than M23. It is Rwanda and it is probably other countries that are supporting M23. And that's uh, making all this conflict becoming slowly uh, less a Congolese conflict, but more and more a, general, a regional conflict. Lawrence, the UN Special Representative to the region briefing the UN Security Council reported that serious human rights violations are being committed in areas under M23 control, with at least 150 people killed since November. Are M23 fighters a part of that? What are you doing to stop it? Uh, basically, I have to correct uh, uh, so many things that have been said and accusations against the M23, which are not correct. We have to know that uh, basically on 2013, the M23 went in exile. We had 44 armed groups. And today, 10 years, we have 256 armed groups, according to United Nations uh, statistics. So all the murders uh, we're talking about and the violence committed on the populations were done by the groups that are now part of the DRC army that we call them was a land and other uh, armed groups that UNESCO supposed to fight and take uh, get rid of in the DRC. So basically, we have to get the, correct, the, the, the record straight 
the M23 is not responsible for all these crimes okay. that has been what, said by Patrick Muya and other what about, people on the panel. Okay. All what about the areas uh, that M23 Lawrence, what, what about, Lawrence, what about the ADF, um, which has been accused of, of human rights violations? How much control over the ADF does the M23 have? But in the area, if I understand properly, because of Mike sometimes making some uh, different breaking now, but if I understand properly, in the areas that M23 controls, there's no violence of, uh, of human rights uh, abuses. The human rights abuses happen in the DRC government control areas. We've seen in Goma where 150 people were killed in broad daylight by the, by the, by the by police forces of... Uh, of Let's bring in Crystal once again. Crystal, you you mentioned SADC, uh, the, the force, the South African force on, on the ground. How do regional and international actors uh, contribute to uh, or either exacerbating or mitigating the conflict? I mean, what is South Africa's view? Is it committed to bringing peace to the region? Uh, and, and what or who replaces this UN force, which is on the ground right now, which is due to leave at the end of the year? Absolutely, Adrian, and that's, you know, why there's also some confusion until, you know, when is um, the forces, the UN forces withdrawing? How will the two missions work in sync with another? Because, of course, as I mentioned, the SADC mission consists of South Africa, Tanzania and Malawi. So um, I think so firstly, again, um, so it's not the first time that South Africa is in the DRC. It's been there since um, post-apartheid um, 1994, of course, in 1998 with the former President Nelson. And, Mandela. and then it was also part of that mission in 2013 that actually brought the parties together, and as the spokesperson had mentioned. Um, but I think this time around, they're facing much more tougher terrain, as we've heard um, from the various parties. Um, and there's a concern domestically, Adrian, that, um, you know, as much as we have well-trained um, troops on the ground, um, that might not be enough. Um, we've already had body bags arriving back in South Africa. Uh, we've also had a few weeks ago, um, you know, some of our most um, trained, highly trained um, army officials also coming under attack uh, when they were flying an, a helicopter to a UN hospital. So um, there's concern domestically that South Africa is entering a terrain, and as our previous speaker said, that could, you know, engulf the entire region. However, South African officials are still adamant that they are part of a SADC mission. They've been tasked by the regional body to be part of this force to bring about um, peace. Um, South Africa has long time um, pursued the agenda of peace building, of getting different parties together. Um, but I think it's a bit more complicated. We've heard from government spokesperson, we've heard from human rights organization that the human rights violations happening on the ground is absolutely it's devastating with continuing um, displacement. And so I think the concern is that is the South African troops ready um, to lead this mission with Malawi and Tanzania? And then more importantly, do they have the financial resources and the adequate equipment to actually deal with the different rebel groups that are operating in the East? Fred, how, how dangerous is this situation right now? Could it escalate into a, a regional war? Well, I think we, we, we're almost there. Um, we've, um, the, there is a clear involvement of Rwanda. There is uh, 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 allegations of Uganda being involved. South Africa is, um, have casualties, and Burundi is very involved. So we, I think we are already... Um, uh, on the on the eve of uh, of regional war, and there is a need uh, to de-escalate uh, very very quickly. But I also like to uh, to say something on on the human rights violations and the human rights situation in in Eastern DRC. I think it's clear for for everybody, uh, human rights organizations and civil society in Eastern DRC that M23 has committed a lot of uh, of human rights violation in this. Uh, in this um, iteration of their their movement, as well as in 2013 and 2012 when they were there, uh, we 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 heard um, the massacres that they committed in in Kishishe and, and in Bambo. Um, there is a lot of schools that have been attacked. There is uh, hospitals that have been looted, um, and especially uh, the, the women and and kids who are who are dying as a consequences of these conflicts. Um, 
is is in enough uh, for for people in this region to they, they've been enduring this for years, and I think it's time for this conflict to end, and it's time for impunity for all these groups that keep recycling themselves since uh, 1996 at least to to end definitely. Lawrence, what would it take for the M23 to sit down with the government in Kinshasa? Is it interested in negotiating? Uh, the M23 always asks for uh, a dialogue with the DRC government all along. We've been saying that for, for, for donkey's years, that we need to have a, a direct dialogue with the DRC government to discuss with them how to solve the root causes of the conflict that is all the time the cycle of war in our country. But I have to go back to what the gentleman just said just now. This all this stuff is said, they are not proven. This is just propaganda, voice of the DRC government, because the M23, as I said, was in exile from uh, 2013. And we came back here. All the crimes that are done before, they are done by the people that are now in the DRC government army. So we're talking about Kishishi, as he said. The ESC was in the MONESCO was in the Did they give any other evidence that M23 has done that kind of stuff that they're claiming for? No, there's no evidence of it. So the M23 is calling on the international community to come and support people in Masisi, where the humanitarian crisis is unprecedented. So many people are sleeping outside. The DRC government is throwing bombs every single day, like it did in Mueso killing children, women, and elderly people. This is what we're talking about, the real things with evidence, no propaganda. So we are calling an international community to act right now because the crisis in the Masisi is really huge in the moment. Fred, do you want to come back on that? There's a lot of evidence of mass graves in, in, uh, in around Kishish, and, and we can go on and on. And there, is also, there was also evidence of, uh, of of killings in, in before uh, and all this with a lot of uh, impunity i think mr uh, lawrence knows key, uh, exactly uh, what i'm talking about there is also evidence of uh, of of arbitrary killings in in areas where m23 controlled and i'm not saying that the Congolese government is, is perfect and doesn't commit human rights violation but in in the in the um, in this conflict, uh, clearly, M23 is responsible of many and massive human rights violations, including in area that uh, it's, it, is, it is controlling. What, is, what, is, what makes uh, this situation um, complicated is also that people are tired of this um, belligerence. Every time people have uh, what they call root causes of conflict, they, they go back to take to taking guns, and every time it's actually put at risk the very people the M23 are trying to uh, to to protect. At some point, people M23 and other group need to to stop uh, going back to to uh, military responses as as ways of uh, of resolving their, their their problem, and think of actually the way to protect. Different communities in DRC for, uh, for 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 long, and not only put not not putting at risk the very very people they are pretending uh, to 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 defend. This this cannot bring peace today, and it cannot bring uh, peace tomorrow. And maybe one last thing for this conflict as well as as uh, from Saint Pay and and the first M23. Every time Rwanda withdraw its supports to M23 or to Saint Pay, those group. Uh, okay. ended. So well, this time again, the gov I think the Congolese government and the Congolese people are, are right to say Rwanda should be pushed and pressured to withdraw its support to M23. That's, yeah, well, that I'll, should I'll, be I'll, clear. I'll come back to you in just a moment on, on, on this issue of Rwanda, but first, Crystal, uh, uh, as we draw to a close, um, uh, what are the some potential avenues for... Uh, OK, Lawrence, very quickly, I'll give you 30 seconds, OK? Yes, I'm saying to the gentleman, I'm uh, replying to the gentleman that's claiming stuff that is outside the country. We are on the ground. We have other NGOs that are here that notice everything every single day that the DRC government is the one committing crimes in the moment. We say this so many times that the DRC government should be charged about crimes against humanity and war crimes. 
the M23 called many many times for people to come to do a joint investigation on Kishishi. We are okay. available. We said, come over. We can go together and do the all investigation right. all together. They never came. So all these claims are just the voice of the DRC government, a propaganda of Muyaya and the others. That's why the NGOs and other organizations right. close to the uh, DRC government Crystal, will forget uh, it. Crystal, uh, uh, some potential avenues for achieving lasting peace and stability in the region. Are, are there any? Um, uh, what, what obstacles are standing in the way? Well, listening to the M23 spokesperson, spokesperson, Adrian, you can clearly hear there's a lot of obstacles. But I think on a serious note that, um, you know, from South Africa's vantage point, President Chichikedi is the elected president of the country. And he has called that he wants peace in the East. Um, he's also, uh, um, of course, accused Rwanda um, of supporting that M23 rebels. And we know Rwanda has denied this. Um, but I think, you know, from the vantage point from the, uh, down south is that um, there's a belief that you have to bring the wearing parties together. It has happened before. It's happened in 2013. Um, it happened in 1998. Um, and so there is the view is that you have to bring these parties together to get lasting peace. However, um, the troops, the SADC mission will be on the ground for one year. We've already had casualties. One can only hope that the resources will be there for both the Malawi and Tanzanian and the um, South African troops. And of course, a mission of a peace, um, a peacekeeping mission is to, to kind of get some peace. Um, but so far, we've seen mortar attacks. And so one would hope that the different parties will actually realize that the conflict can't continue and the human rights violations can't continue and that lasting peace is the only answer um, for um, that part of the world. And, and Fred, we've, we've got a minute left. Um, uh, uh, Rwanda, which of course continues to, to deny that it supports the M23 anyway, what's, what's it going to take to bring peace to the region and for Rwanda to withdraw its support for M23? For Rwanda to withdraw its support, I think it needs to be pressured by, by uh, many countries that support him. The, the, the UK, uh, France, the US, uh, China, and, and and other countries that are, are working closely to the Rwanda uh, government. But to, to bring peace uh, to DRC, it's not only about sitting at the table and signing papers. They, that has been tested uh, several times uh, since the beginning of the war. What the Congress government will have to do uh, at the end, it will, it will, the Congress government will need to build an army that can um, deter those kind of threats and at the same time work uh, on on root causes uh, in in the time of it's not in time of peace. Unfortunately, the situation like M23 does not give a lot of, a lot of space for for a constructive discussion uh, among, among actors. Okay. And I think for that to happen, um, the the support that M23 okay. is benefiting right now should cease. Thank you all for being part of our program today, Lawrence Kanyuka, Crystal Audison, and Fred Barmer, and right at the beginning, Patrick Muyoya. And uh, thank you for watching. You can see the programme again at any time by going to the website at aljazeera.com. For further discussion, you could join us at our Facebook page, which you'll find at facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. And you can join the conversation on X. Our handle there at AJ Inside Story. From me, Adrian Finnegan, and the team here, we'll see you again. Bye for now.